Get up with these guys. Jane Massey, Danny Cash. It's uh, thanks for having us. It's good to be here. So what we'll do is we'll have a little tart. It's that time. And there's not going to be probably a better weekend than this one coming up. We've got a full moon on Saturday. I've always liked the three days before and three days after a moon. The tides tomorrow. It's going to be a high tide around noon. It's going to be a low tide around 7 o'clock. And then each day, as you might know, it's going to be an hour later. It's going to be an hour later. So after the moon, after Saturday's moon, the days after that, at the end of the tide, it'll be in the dark. Those darkers don't mind eating in the dark either. There's going to be a crab flush. It might be really good. It's going to be that ripping out going tide in the afternoon, late afternoon, is likely when the crab flow is going to happen. And very likely it'll be good in South Pass, maybe North Pass there at the Egmont. Skyway is always a good bet in that, in that time. Bean Point is always worth a look if you don't find the fish there, either in South or North Pass. And, um, you know, as you all know, there's many ways to catch a tarpon. There's the Skyway, there's the Hull, there's Bean Point, there's beach fishing, there's bay fishing. Just the other day, Saturday, we were catching bay. We had a bottom fishing trip. We were just going mango snapper fishing. And while we were there, inside, past the grill, anchored up, chumming, catching beautiful bay for, for mango snapper. We had tarpon roam all over the boat. Inside the pass, way up in there, just in, right there by Vina Del Mar. And they're everywhere now, they're supposed to be. I've heard there was a ton of fish up there at Port Manatee. And what they're doing up in there, there's all these fry baits up there, all these glass minnows and small fry baits, and these tarpon are going up there just getting mouthfuls of them. Bad part about that is oftentimes when they're in that mood, hard to get them to eat anything else. But getting back to the this week, you know, like I said, tomorrow, Wednesday will be the beginning of, I think, what's going to be a good crab flush. I'm hoping that it is. But if that doesn't work out, there's many, many other options. You know, and the tackle involved. So back in the day, you know, it was so funny. The, the evolution of carbon fishing has changed so much. Since when I was a kid, when I was fishing and growing up, it was incredible. The guides caught most of the fish back in the day. And not because they were a whole lot better fishermen, but they were a whole lot better casters. And back in the day, the big beach fishing consisted of primarily throwing corks and pinfish. You know, and I had the privilege of growing up with Bobby Buswell, Joe Dvorak, Sonny Aylesworth, Buster Herzog. I get to watch those guys fish every day, and it was incredible. Back in the day, you know, most of those guys, they, they were conventional reels. This is, like I said, the evolution of tarp fish has changed so dramatically. There weren't no spinners. Nobody fished with spinning rod. They fished with those cumbersome long rods conventional reels. Now, you know, with spinners, we don't backlash. But that, those guys are so good, and that's all I wanted to do. And I practice and practice and practice. But one tip I could give you to be a better carbon fisherman, become a better caster. And it's not changed. You know, whether you're using a spinning rod, conventional tackle, whatever it is, the presentation is the most important thing when carbon fishing. It's like anything else. The more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. Fishing in a hole, as you probably know, making the bait look the most natural is the key to success. You don't want to be in the hole, fish rolling around, and your bait dragging behind your boat. Throw that bait up tight, get that crab, throw him up tight, let him drift back naturally. That's when you're going to get the hits. That's when it's going to happen. It's not going to be when you're pulling that thing, because that doesn't look natural at all. This is how you want. I like a reel like this. I like a rod this length. You'll notice that the rod, your, your line to line knot, your braid to your mono, doesn't go through the guide. Repeatedly doing that is going to tear the, 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 the inserts out of there, the ceramic inserts. A little longer rod allows you a longer leader that doesn't pass through that tip and rip that ceramic guide out. The line capacity on these reels is 300 yards, 50 pound test braid, monofilament leader. Depends on two, if you want to catch a fish or you just want to jump. If you want to jump them, use 60 pound test. Sure. You're not going to catch a whole lot of them because they're going to wear through it more often than not. But again, if you want to catch them, I like the 80 and still, you're going to lose a ton on 80 just because they'll wear through them. But we're bottom fishing, use a dead shad. Shoot, I'll use a 150 pound test leader. Doesn't have to be fluorocarbon because it's laying on the bottom, it doesn't matter. You know, when, you're, when the line is up in the water column, you want it invisible, you want it clear, so fluorocarbon is the way to go. But line to line, Huge key. Five-watt hook is what I like, but 
And then again, depending on your faith, come and God to honor. There's many, many companies that make great hooks, strong hooks, ones that aren't going to work out. I crimp mine. You know, a lot of people tie knots. I don't. I crimp them, especially with my heavy stuff. Like when I'm using bottom stuff, when I'm using my shed, you know, think about tying a knot with a 150 pound test. It's not real pretty. If you're at B point, you know, you're, you're chunking. Hives coming in, your content. There's another thing. If somebody's out fishing you at B point, likely the reason is because he's got more chum than you do. And that's the whole key there. Chum, 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 chum. And then work your rods. Don't just throw your rods out and let them sit. Work them. Throw them up high and let them drift back. When, you, when you're chumming, you're constantly chumming, you drop your bait right there back behind your motor and let it drift right back naturally with the regular with the chunks that you're chunking with. It gets back there a little way, reel it back in and do it all over again. The guys that, are, that do better than the most are the guys that work it. They, they let the baits out. They don't let them sit back there and spin in the tide. They constantly reel them up, let them back out. Reel them up, let them back out. Another way, same situation. I witnessed this one day when I was at Skyway Bridge. Everybody was drifting through there. Now, naturally, you get anchored there. But, but as we were drifting through, I noticed a guy that had a cork on was getting considerable more bites than I was. Well, I didn't like that, so I tried to figure out what the deal was. Added this cork, held it up a little bit. Now, there's time, and I'm going to pass around some stuff that you're going to see. They're little split shots, and you can either add it way down at the hook to make it easier for throwing a crab. You know, you think of a little pass crab, that's the way of lick. So it's hard to cast, it's hard to let out there. But by adding, you can add a split shot. And these are pretty big split shots. But anyway, either either put it right down there on the hook, or you can put it up here mid leader. Nothing seems to have made a lot, a whole lot of difference. But you put the small fork on there for a small bait. Here's another trick that, if, and you guys, I'm, I'm sure you've experienced, because it used to drive me crazy. When I had a cork that would, if I was throwing my rods out there and let them sit. Now, when you're working a school of fish down the beach, that's one thing, because you're constantly reeling it in, you know, doing all that. But if you're anchored up and you're just sitting there with your cork out, you've got some bottom baits out, perhaps, and you want to, you want to add to it. You want to, you want to put some a live bait out there. If you don't have a swivel, you know, a line, line, I, I love. But if you don't have a swivel on there, and you all have done it, you reel it up, and it looks like spaghetti. By doing this, what you do is you got your line to line, you've got your braid to your mono, let it run down, but then under your cork have a swivel, and it will prevent all that from happening. Use a line bait. Everybody's done it with double hooking a bait. Is that the worst? You've got these little beads you put on, and, and you can use hell. You can bite off a piece of a rubber worm and stick it on there, or even a rubber band, a thicker rubber band, put it on there, and what you do is it prevents the bait from sliding up the shaft of the hook and makes it impossible to double hook the bait. I just read that up on a little piece of paper. We just pass that around. It, 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 in other words, your green bag, your white bait, it can't slide up there and double hook. It holds it right there in that place. Don't slide it up too far because then it will, it will allow it to get double hook again. You also, a lot of you guys still tie knots on it. If, if, if you haven't tried to crimp donut, you know, my first thought was, are you kidding me? There's no way in the world that that's not going to pull through. Well, let me tell you, it doesn't. I've never had one pull through in my life. So let's get back to beach fishing. Beach fishing is one of my, you know, that, I, to me, is probably one of the most challenging things. It's not as cool as it used to be because now it's become so popular, which is another good thing. Tarpon fishing, you know, there's so many people that are into it now. Back in the day, you didn't have to you didn't have to share a school of fish with others you know now oh, they go out there and there might be seven boats on a single school of fish and it's so frustrating but you know these guys just want to stay on the school stay on the school stay on the school so it's very difficult to work a school of fish with several boats but if you have that opportunity it's, it's I think still the most challenging getting up ahead of the school waiting on them to come to you you know, accurately casting, presenting your bait well ahead of the oncoming school, never throwing a bait, getting back to that presentation thing. It's not natural for baits to be falling on top of them, you know. They, it doesn't rain, it doesn't rain crabs or greenbacks, you know, and it's not supposed to be. The ideal situation, get well ahead of that school, let them come on, let them come on, have your bait presented out there, got some bottom baits out there, you got your top baits out there, let them come to you. That's when you'll have the most success. All right, let's do a little something different here. This rod, you guys, and this is probably 
you know, one of my favorite ways of fishing for a number of reasons. One is you don't have to fish in a crowd. You find your own spot and you get, there's a million spots, you know, being old, I know a bunch of them, I've lived there all my life, so I know for a lot of spit spots. Right, the tarpener creatures a habit, they go back to the same places year after year after year, you know, and I've got a whole bunch of spots. You get the opportunity to get multiple hookups. You're going to find that these big schools of fish that we're seeing now, that you're going to start seeing, they're going to end up breaking up, and they're going to come in smaller pods. They're going to be in three, four, you know, you might see a bunch of single fish. And what you're going to do is you're going to anchor on the edge, and the edge being just outside the squash and on the downside of the bar that runs the lake for most of our beaches along here. Different beaches, different depths. You know, here off the Don, it, you might be fishing in eight feet of water, nine feet of water, because that's where the edge is. You get up there, you try and figure out what line there, you know, obviously fish don't all come down to the beach in single file. But you figure out where the max or where the most of them, where the mass is, which, what, how what depth are they? You may have to adjust some, and you will. You know, if you, if you're noticing most of the fish you're seeing rolling are in the inside of it, it will move over a cast. If you're seeing an outside of it, pretty obvious that way. But what you can do, and what we do, is we throw eight rods out, spread them all out, chum like heck, you know, and let them come to us. Here, there's a that baby's been Yeah, now he's frozen, so he ain't as cool as he could be, but I mean, if it wasn't, he'd be dripping slime, and, and, uh, and, and that's the other thing I want to tell you about. Sometimes when we get shad, and they're a day or two old, They'll get soft, like every other kind of bait does. And normally, I like to tail hook them. I'm going to show you that in a second. But when your bait gets soft, uh, very often times when you cast them, you'll throw him off, you know, when he gets soft like that. So what you'll do is you'll head hook him. You'll hook him like that. Hard to cast, because obviously that's not aerodynamic when you, when you throw him like that. What I normally like to do, that's the way I really like to do it. And I hope it doesn't thaw enough where his guts fall out. But there again, if this was Fred, he wasn't frozen, I like to offer him up just like that. And the reason being, because he seeps that red blood and that slime. It's almost like a self-contained chunk. And, not only that, but, you know, that's a big bait. But you've got stuff to think about. You know, an 80-pound tarpon can swallow a football. So, I mean, he's got plenty of mouth for it. That's a nine-hot gamagatsu. Seems like an awful big hook. But I like that, if you'll notice, I like to bait him as far back there as I can to expose a whole lot of the hook, rather than hide the hook in him or hook him. If, if I hook him up any deeper, there'd be less hook exposed, and my hookup percentage is a lot worse then. So whack his head off, throw him out there just like that, let him sit on the bottom. But getting back to the shad thing, you know, there too again, like any other kind of fish, they're where you find them. Sometimes they're abundant, and, it, and it's, it's really good and really easy. Our nephew has been catching my bait, and I never let him out of my sight during carpet season. And it's frozen, not... Uh, oh, I, I, I don't like them frozen. Yeah, see, that's the thing. A frozen shad never no shad, in my opinion, but I don't like them. I, I take such good care of my bait when I get them. I ice them. And it's not saying that you can't catch them, you know, with one of those red baits, oh. but he is. You need to be the only boat out there. So in other words, if you're out there with two or three day old bait, you got a guy, you know, 100 yards away from you throwing fresh shad, it makes a big difference. How long is your leader and what kind of weight do you use to keep it on? Good question. Uh, that is a good question. You figure a 150 pound fish is 70 feet, he's six feet tall. So I use a six foot lead. I would rather not use a weight if I don't have to. But like on these, on stronger tides and depending on where we're fishing, it's like we're fishing in the Manatee River or we're fishing even at Port Manager, anywhere where the tide, you know, is filtered down or reduced and it rips through there, I'll, I'll put a weight at least on my front rod. I'll use you know, sometimes as much as two ounce, but you understand that when that fish is up and jumping, you don't want that extra weight flopping around out here because that's going to help yank the hook out of the fish's mouth. I want to fish a whole bunch of rods, which I normally always do. You know, I'll, I'll have to weight some of them. Hey, Jay, if you can't find Chad, what's your other dead bait on the bottom? I'll, you know, I've done well with ladyfish. I've done well with a mullet. Back when I was a kid, shoot, we used to use grunts and, and pinfish. There's not a fish that a tarpon won't eat. This is really a blue crab. It's not a pass crab. But you know what I found? And you guys probably have too. If you, and I'm, I'm sure it was, they're built for a, a defense mechanism, but if you take a pair of needle nose pliers when he's alive, and just press, squeeze it right there on the, on the hinge, he lets go of that claw. It, you know, he just lets go of it. 
So when you're dipping your crabs, you know, I do that immediately. I've got a little pair of needle nose on there, and I just grab that, let the clay go. Oftentimes, if, if, you know, think about how delicate he is. That's a small little crab. So when you start pulling on it, not killing, if you don't break them off right or if it doesn't twist off right, but try that thing with a needle nose pliers. It's the darndest thing you've ever seen. Some people leave the claws on. I don't for a couple reasons. One, because he can climb back up the leader. The other is when you're reaching that bucket to grab him. <laughs> now this is this is exact race. I, I'll be honest with you. I, I don't do good on these big crabs. I'll never understand it, but a big blue crab I don't do good at. I like a little crab that it's a, just a little bit bigger than the past crabs that we see. And there's days that I've done much better on the blue crabs than I have on the past crabs. However, the days when it really gets rocking in the hole and when there's nothing but those past crabs, sometimes that's all they want. And you'll do better on a past crab than you do the little blue. Also notice the little blue crab digs deeper, he dives deeper than the past crab. So you just got altered up and mix it up some. Yeah, folks, I like either an eight or nine odd gamagatsu for that fade. As thick as, thick as that fade is, that's not too big a hook. Are circle hooks required? For yeah, that's funny that you said that. No, they're not required. And to be honest with you, I've used them both. I'll be, I've had mixed results. I, I, my hookup percentage is not any better with a circle hook than it is with a J hook. I know a lot of people swear by the circle hook. And, and you know, I, personal preference, I think, is what that gets down to. And don't you think it's harder to get a circle hook out of the fish than it is to get a J hook out? Sure. Yeah. Which, you know, tarpon, you yeah. can't keep. You know, you don't keep them, you're not harvesting, you're not, you just don't do it. So the easier and the quicker release yeah. is better. But this time of year, you know, like I said, it, it, this could be a great weekend, I think, you know, depending on the weather, naturally. But it sure see. I mean, everything's stacking up to be really good. And it's going to start tomorrow, I think. You know, this is going to be the third day before the Saturday's full moon. And then it's going to extend a while. And a buddy of mine, who has spent a lot of time on the water lately, keeping his nose in it, said a lot of tarpon have just now shown up in a lot of these places. They've been in the bay for weeks. You know, way up the bay, up beyond Courtney Campbell, way up in that neck of the wood. Another buddy of ours on Saturday caught one at the bootleg. Didn't see a lot of fish, but he caught a fish there. Had another one on. And then places like Westinghouse and up there by the Franklin, what I call the Franklin Hole. Um, you know, there's been fish up there for quite some time. Port Manatee, there's been a fish there. Snell Isle Reef, you know, they come and go there. There's been a big knot of fish there for a while. You know, side scanners, y'all got side scanners on your boat? God, that's, man, what a big difference that has made, hasn't it? God, you cruise along the Skyway and look at your side scanner, you can tell which hole you want to sit in. You know, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Same way at Egmont. I mean, those fish, you know, they're not always up in shore, but you look at that side scanner, you can figure out where they're at. It's pretty cool. I'll tell you how else I've done well on the incoming to Egmont, Anch on the north side now, anchoring up on that shallow water, and there again, put my shad, laying my shad right there on the edge of that, on that right incoming shore. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we've rocked it. God, we've had some incredible days there doing And on the outcome, would you spend more time fishing in the hole or do you, do you ever go out to the outside of that shore? I do. If the fish are out there, I mean, I'll go out there with the fish, you know what I mean, and you'll see it. And that's another thing you're going to find. It. A lot of these guys are going to leave, you know, when, when, when it gets dark later on in the afternoon. Man, those fish, sometimes I've had some of the better days ever when everybody's gone. You know, the storms come through, and that's what you got to keep your eye on all. After those storms clear, it's like this. Any rhyme or reason to, like, I mean, if, if you were going to play the hole, do you... And you're starting at the beginning of the class. Is there any process to how do you go from beginning to end of time? Are you working up inside and work out? Do you work out, move in? It's like it's, you know what I mean? Well, there's no substitution for just using your eyes. Where do you yeah. see? Where do you see? No substitute for that. How do you handle the poles and the hammers? Oh, you, you, you don't. You, you don't. <laughs> There's no way to avoid them. Oh, we've lost them every way in the world. Debbie fought a fish for an hour and a half one day. 140 pound fishes back in the day. And this freaking hammerhead, I mean, he came up, it was all, it was like he was insulting. He came up, he grabbed her fish, and then he swam up to the boat like a dog, like a bone in a dog in a, a in the mouth, and shook it at us. Like, yeah, look at my guy, I got your fish. It was scary was that we were in an 18 foot boat. My favorite boat, by the way, it was in Orlando. Yeah. I all loved it one life. And it swam right by the boat, and, and I kid you not, I thought it was about 14 foot long. Yeah, it was, it was the scariest. It's horrific, but you can't, I mean, at the Skyway, same way Kingfish, golly, 
I think the biggest kingfish I've ever had all my life. We had at the Skyway Bridge, and a, uh, a shark got it. And then, you know, what, what can you do? You can't do a thing. I mean, <laughs> not with a tackle you're using, your 20 pound toast. You're not going to pull him away from him, that's for sure. You know, actually, I like a five. The bigger hook is better for me, but I mean, I match up most of those pass grabs and those little little to a five. But that's, uh, there again, another personal preference. That's my Do you, do you downsize the leader with a smaller hook? No. No. I'll be honest with you. I, you know, I've tried that 60 a lot. And quite frankly, now, at this point in time in my life, in the way that the, the, the tournament, the, you know, all release tournament, all release format. So, you know, I get, you try 60, but I've lost so many fish on 60 pounds. This is silly. You know, just unless they're hinge hooked or button hooked through the thing, you know, any, it doesn't take much wear with that sandpaper mouth to get through 60, as you know. You know, so 80 gives you a little better chance, but I'll be honest with you, I, they wear through my 150 pound test on my bottom rods in Shad, because very often it's hooked a little deeper, so the whole time you're fighting him, whether it be 20 minutes or an hour, constantly wearing inside that mouth, you know, he'll wear through 150, trust me, I've lost a bunch of them that way. You know, back in the day, we used 90 pound, seven strand cable, it wasn't, it wasn't a single strand, but seven pound, or seven strand of wire, we used 90, for our bottom rod and 60 for our cork rod. But we have found that we've got so many more bites of mono filling. And when you say mono, you're not fluoro, mono, does it matter? Oh, it does. I like fluoro for the, you know, my the white tackle stuff. But for my bottom, it's like I said, I don't think it makes a little difference because it's laying on the bottom. Yeah. It's not like your, you know what I mean? I, that might be 125, but I like that or 150 pound death. It doesn't have to be fluoro. Laying on the bottom. Not big ones, but I've surely caught my share of, of tarpon on, on mullet, but not live. I can't say that I have a lot live. I'll tell you what I have done. Trolling ladyfish for kingfish, like at Port Manatee. Should we have jumped three tarpon one day on our kingfish rods? Kingfish. <laughs> tarpon. And, I, and I've caught several tarpon on live ladyfish. But yeah, and I've heard of guys doing real well. We've caught them over at Port Manatee on, uh, on live ladyfish. They're hard to track, though, you know what I mean? That, that's the other bad thing about it. When, you know, he's swimming all over. He got eight rods, six or eight rods out. He's swimming all over, tangling everything else up. Think about all the time. When our trips down the Keys over the years, houses that we've rented, you know, the best we've done tarpon fishing on the scraps after cleaning the mahi. There's nothing better than that. I've always wondered how that would work here. I mean, I can't imagine why it would. Cool thing, I've lived in my neighborhood since 1968. And the first time, the very first time, it was just less than a year ago, while we were cleaning Snapper, you know, on Jay's. He's got a really cool cleaning station, so, you know, four people in quality control. You know, five of us can stand, you know, can stand in the same spot. And we constantly throw the, you know, the scraps out. Well, we have hundreds of catfish, big ones, and they're, you know, they all eat that, and we get an occasional snook. Well, I don't know how many months ago it was. It was the coolest thing ever. All of a sudden, just this monster tail and this big flash came out from under the dock. And I heard the little hard head catfish would be made. You know what? I tried. I did, I, there was a year that was really difficult, and I was down in Sarasota Bay, tarpon fishing, and, uh, all I had, had, the biggest thing we had in Boca Bay, and I put him out there, I've never done it, but I've probably not used him enough, I haven't given him enough chance. But I've heard in Miami they use them, they catch them on catfish. They just tell you to break the fins off, right? Don't they? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you break the fins off. But I'd use them if that's all I had. <laughs> Tom, great question, you asked about artificial. You know, we're the luckiest guys in the world, I mean, we got Eric Bachman, we got Ray Market, those are the, the gurus of artificial baits. I, I'm just, I'm not done a lot of artificial carpet. But those guys, I mean, Ray, obviously, he knows that stuff well. And I know there's guys that slay them on artificials and flies. You know, it's funny, a lot of those pier rats, we know that from the piers of Indian Rocks and Reddington are now going to the Skyway. You know, and they're doing it the same way. They're throwing the outlines out there, you know, just like they would have done off the pier. Doing it pretty much the same way. Shoot, I saw a guy kite fishing out there. But, you know, they're catching, they catch monster kingfish and they're jumping the hell out of carp and they will again. Do you think the uh, red tide is going to cut down on the beach fishing? Sure. God, I'm paying on it. You 
know an early indication, sir, then no. Yeah. I don't I don't think so. I really don't. I mean I've heard of guys already seeing big bunches of fish along the beach, you know what I mean? And that's a good sign. There was a couple of big knots of fish right inside past grill. When I say right inside past grill, between past grill and blind pass, you know, right there. Hadn't quite got around the corner yet. They were just laid up in your dark spot. You know, you can see the black. You know, so and that's a good sign. And then other guys have seen fish coming down the beach along past grill. And I've not been further. I haven't been any further north. In the morning is that time, or is it? You can't get there early enough, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I want to be the first guy there. I don't want anybody coming up on me. I don't want a guy running down the beach looking for me. You know, I want to go find your own fish. I'm going to find mine. Yeah. But I get it, and I share it. You know, we have to this day and age, because I mean, there's, which is a good thing. A term has gotten so popular. A lot of people want to do it, and I get it. You know what I mean? But if we all work together, shoot, we, there's plenty of them out there for all of us. And you know what's funny is sometimes paying attention, you know, trying to pay attention, like you're going to miss them. They go outside, and the key is, is if you're if you're fishing with another boat, we've been so successful for miles and miles and miles with the same school, the same eating school. But you just have to know how to work them. If you're, you know, you get ahead and you're sitting there and you're ready, and they go out, say you missed them. Big deal. Just you know, pull the anchor and get back up ahead, let those guys have their turn, and then go up ahead of them. You can fish the same school of fish, eating fish, which is really cool, for a long, long time if you're patient. That's and you don't have bee pickers, you know, that are doing what we were just talking about, which is, you know, s sneaking in when, yes. you know, they're not taking their time and giving them a wiper. So what's a good secondary target over the weekend? Other than tarpon? Yeah. <laughs> Mango snapper. We did that on Saturday. That was the opening day of the Suncoast Tarpon Roundup, but we had a couple people that really wanted to just get some eat fish, do some bottom fish. So we ended up catching the most beautiful four inch Spanish sardines um, for bait and then ran up inside the bay, up by, way up by the sea cut, caught the heck out of mangoes. And I mean some beauties in a lot of them. Big. I mean some nice, you know, for the bay, big mango. Jerry, you some frozen chum or just chunks? No, I'd rather, but I'd prefer it. Fresh. Fresh red blood. Slimy. Uh. <laughs> but sometimes you have to. You know, if you, if you don't, you only get a bucket, you know, when you really wanted to, then, you know, that's the beauty of Jane. I will tell you that. If shad doesn't always come real readily, it's not like you can go buy it, you know, at the, at the tackle shop. Sometimes you can. But if you, if you take care of it, and you freeze it right away when you get back. You're not fishing tomorrow. You've got my nephew who catches our shad for us. He brines it when he catches it, and then we layer it with ice. So we don't brine it at home, but he brines it as he catches it, which makes it harder. Thank you guys very much. You don't